Hello everyone, today we talk about the Battle of Courtrai, also better known as the Battle of, of the Golden Spores, that was fought between the Royal Army of France and rebellious forces of the County of Flanders on July the 11th, 1302, during the Franco-Flemish War of 1297-1305, took place near the town of Courtrai, I should pronounce it correctly, at least one of you from, uh, I think that is Flemish, actually sent, this is, should be the right, I, I try, I will say a lot of, of um, you know, of wrong things t today, because th there are other names to read, and I don't know, but, I mean, I hope this is not the main problem, I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, in, in modern day Belgium, and resulted in um, an unexpected victory for the Flemish, um, it's, uh, today, we will talk about the tactical side of the story. That's how we make uh, the battle videos on Schwerpunkt, but this is exactly not a battle like others. This is not a victory like others. And I promise that we will make a video dedicated entirely to the significance of the Battle of Courtrai in the broader um, context of um, medieval warfare, but not only in a way, uh, as we will do for Bouvin that we uh, analyzed instead last summer, because these are, you know, battles that, conceptually speaking, bear a, a lot of, of meaning that uh, should be, you know, more broadly analyzed. To today, perhaps, I will address some issues uh, about this battle, mostly drawing from the interpretation of the tactical engagement. Uh, I will base myself mostly on the account of uh, Verbruggen, right, in the, uh, the Art of Warfare in Western Europe during the Middle Ages, from the 8th century to the 1340s, this is a text of reference. Um, I have a digital uh, digital version, I suspect the pages are actually not the correct ones from the written edition. There is the, the you know, the text in, in the original language too. Um, there is also a beautiful study uh, by De Vries that was actually his PhD that eventually became uh, here, the title Infantry Warfare in the early 14th century. This is a text that inspired also my own research, but today I read um, the part about the Battle of Courtrai and I realized that, of course, he had a slightly different, um, a slightly different focus from Verbruggen, because basically the Vries had mostly to determine whether infantry had been decisive or not alone uh, in the battle, and that's basically the leitmotiv of, of the of the whole work. Verbruggen is more, uh, you know. On spot on, but more objective, more informative. It's just four pages, but uh, it's uh, that's military logic. Right? If you want to find someone that really makes the point, I found uh, De Vries find uh, it gives a very beautiful list of all the sources. It makes interesting quotes, but uh, from that text, uh, in my opinion, first of all, there are, I'll say it honestly, there are s s certain things I disagree on, um, and I like Verbruggen's version most, but just for saying that. Uh, the Battle of Courtrai at this point in the early 14th century presents so many different sources that in order to be studied we you know we would take um, many videos at once and frankly also time that we can estimate it in months because I told you I I often tell you when I wrote that master degree on the Battle of Markfeld I you know I spent yeah okay not really one wall year but let's say altogether let's say six months Right, and th there weren't objectively even many <clears throat> this overwhelming amount of sources. And Courtrai is this legendary battle in many ways, especially f from the Flemish perspective. In my opinion, the Vries excels a bit too much the, um, you know, the certain aspects of this battle. You know, he mostly digresses on on factors that, according to me, were not so important as much as the simplicity of all of it. Right, and that's that's exactly also part of the criticism I was talking about you before, that there are not many recondite, uh, you know, difficulties to understand how the battle went, always giving that we can not fully know, like in any other thing in history, how it really went, especially with this level of documentation, it is dense, but also for, for those time standards, not our own, also the sources write in very different ways. So, um, videos like these, uh, you know, if I make a 
uh, as you have seen, if you make a, uh, an ancient battle video, that's literally two sources. I read them, and that that's all you need to know, literally. Uh, with medieval battles, especially from this time, most of the times you can't do that, right? Yeah, early medieval battles are a bit like that too, but here it's it's much more complicated because Europeans wrote much more than before uh, from many different realities, especially these ones that are very, um, you know, the democratic, let's call it this way, and anachronistically speaking, so that were actually the same locals that wrote for their own consumption. They weren't, you know, highly sophisticated, um, you know, uh, ideological works. Uh, but nevertheless, and thankfully, they are much more concrete and objective in, at, at many levels. Uh, I can tell you that I care very much for this battle and this topic because I it, it pushed me in a way to 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 write the thesis that I'm finishing now, that I hope will say something more. Um, also, abroad, giving U European warfare. I don't know whether you know. First of all, <laughs> let me get the. Uh, the, the the PhD and then the, we, we can't talk about whether I, I, I ever will publish it or not. But it, it's very important because it deals with Flemish warfare as well, in my opinion, in a way that is uh, essentially comparative with other realities of Western warfare. And I think I came up with a theory that maybe some would will not really appreciate because when we talk about these battles, we also talk about a um, mythology behind it. That is in part history, but in part, in fact, can say fiction. But um, let's say it's um, it, it's subjective, right? Uh, and in in military history, possibly the most important method of working is comparative analysis. That is to say, um, before you get to know these battles, you see them as different dots on the map and on the chronological spectrum, and you say, ah, oh, this was important, yeah, why? Because here the, the, the Flemish knocked down the flower, the, literally the best of, of Western cavalry. So it was a big thing, okay, yeah, but in terms of the, the technicality of it, in terms of the, you know, literally the, the, the history of the military art, how, um, let's say, this was exceptional and remarkable, right, in, 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 especially in terms of actual outcome of the battle. But how sophisticated were these military systems and how especially would they fare over time? Actually this is not the first video I make on Flemish warfare. I made actually I think I covered the wall low middle ages. I made a video on Flemish uh, warfare from the 11th to the 13th century, another from, in fact, the, four, the 14th and 15th century, and in the latter we have observed how fundamentally, aside from Courtrai and uh, a pair of other battles that were way less, you know, uh, total in 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 the in the Flemish victory, the, this system didn't objectively go on in any way, right? Uh, the Flemish uh, throughout all the 14th and the 15th century, collectioned, uh, you know, an ast astonishing series of defeats that it's um, it's very important to understand um, from a European perspective, in my opinion. Um, and interestingly enough, the tactical formula that they were using was the same one it was using at Courtrai. Right, so this can give a bit more in depth the, the, the matter of the question. And if you're curious, I just I, I don't remember if I created a medieval Flanders playlist. If, I think it's possible. Yes, I think I made it. So you find all the stuff there, and we will naturally keep talking about each and every one of these battles. Actually, I think this is the very first uh, Flemish battle we we I mean, French versus Flemish battle that we we deal with. Um, I think I will leave it here. And I, then I will give you some other feed about what this battle importantly means. This was an astonishing victory. It's possibly the the the, the most shocking victory of the world Middle Ages. At least in Western Europe, there is something about it that makes it really meaningful and worth thorough considerations. At the same time, it's it doesn't contain anything deterministic, right? There are historians like Frentano, for example, also De Vries quotes that says, ah, here it's the, you know, chivalry dies here, uh, and modernity kicks in. 
I can tell you absolutely not, right? For many reasons, not just because of what we have just said about Flemish history specifically, but also because of the other uh, infantry victories of, of, the, of the first half of the 14th century, where this astonishing series, I mean, they went like uh, one year after the other, right? They were in 50 years and 48 years, they were like 20 or more. Um, and uh, they definitely represent something important, uh, that is this great medieval, high medieval civilization that reached its apex, then eventually cracks in, in, 14, in mid 14th century, so that uh, a different thing begins. And this specific tradition does not survive, and it doesn't survive properly, even um, in those realities that, for, think about the Swiss, right? I insist very much on, on the difference existing between the Swiss battles of the 14th century and the ones of the 15th, right? The Swiss victories, I mean, because they are two very different things. There, there is definitely, a, a, um, you know, a, a link, a connection, if anything, because the Swiss were always... The, you know, despite enlarging, you know, um, as a confeder confederation, but they were basically the same thing, right? So they are the same protagonists, but what they do at a certain point onwards is radically different from before. So many people just look at these battles and see, ah, you see, here there is a gradual, progressive, positive increase of infantry importance throughout all the, the Middle Ages, at uh, the late Middle Ages, it's a democratization of warfare. It has utterly nothing to do with that. Right, uh, it, there is no progressive line of any kind in, in this form, and uh, the history of the 15th century proves it, in my opinion, overwhelmingly. Because the history of 15th century warfare has very much to do with popular, um, with democratic systems. It's princely rule ruling so much that even the Swiss model, that is the exception, basically gets replicated only by the states that had the means to do that. They were all monarchies and princely powers. What happens in the early 14th century is popular, but it ends there, like literally in the mid of the century. Yeah, there are other battles also later on, but there, there are exceptions, small small exceptions compared to the, the concentrated mass you can outline here dramatically in the first um, of the uh, early 14th century. And also there are exceptions in warfare as always, but what counts is the bulk of the, you know, the evidence of the outcome and of the uh, properly what how these battles were fought um, this naturally must be understood also under the light of the nature of Flemish infantry there were something very peculiar in their own way uh, we have often mentioned the similarity for example between uh, Flanders and Italy at this time uh, which is definitely a real thing because these were the richest areas in Europe they had the best infantry but there was an important difference that can be uh, that's incidentally also what I'm studying right now uh, about the levels of development of these military systems and the Flemish infantry in a way uh, were a less advanced system they um, uh, than for example the, the the central northern Italian city states armies because they they were just uh, guilds of uh, of commoners right they didn't have a true professionalism in their uh, in their warfare but properly at, not just as infantry but here we talk about infantry because literally here the Flemish were just infantry and this already tells you that there is something wrong about that, that in fact the Flemish will suffer during the same war against the, the same Franco-Flemish war this time, uh, because for example they will not manage to pursue the enemy uh, they will not manage to, to, to regain initiative, I mean and they will also um, suffer bloodily uh, of this over time so that that's why Courtrai is also a bit of an exception in its own regard even Monon Pavel is, is not really that dramatic uh, victory, at least it's a bitter one at some point, and after that, it's it's difficult even to see uh, some substantial achievements of this kind. Um, so we're talking about, uh, you know, simplicity can also mean effectiveness, but it, it, everything must be contextualized, right? And we will see today, in part, what the even the surprise, in fact, that m m contemporary authors had towards this Flemish victory, because they they didn't actually think much of these communities from a military point of view and historically speaking it seems that aside from this spike well things continued like that right while France kept evolving militarily speaking and accomplished enormous things the English also 
get defeated by the Scots. Scottish infantry's Edward the uh, Third invents this in, or fully matures this 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 incredible system that is not a popular system like the Flemish or the Swiss, and in part not even as the Scottish that was basically yeah it was framed under feudal let's say control, but was fundamentally the the, the Scottish you know commoners did. Um, but that is royal and professional. Eventually, Flanders will be conquered by the Burgundians, who were essentially a you know an expression of, of French military culture. Um, and other victories, think about even uh, Gat, the experiment of the Habsburgs, first of all to control Flanders, but also to, to basically reform their armies at the end of the 15th century alongside the Swiss model that achieves some result, but also doesn't doesn't have uh, you know Flanders didn't have the humus to to make that system flourish so and it, the the experiment was abandoned right so we're talking about realities that must be understood a bit structurally and systematically in the essentials of their political and social nature before their military one which um, Courtrai is also a beautiful expression of because this was as astonishing as it was a, a victory of people who had literally never taken up a weapon in their hands up to the day before, right? So, um, uh, obtained, naturally, on, uh, on, on the literally the best troops that Europe could afford at that point. Um, and the, 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 remarking, the remarkable result is naturally, and that's also why it gave, uh, gave the name to the battle, the Battle of Golden Spores, because this prize that was given to uh, knights at tournament was represent you know the, the knights with golden spurs were norm normally in fact the the high nobility as the one that was butchered at Courtrai were uh, you know taken as a prize by these exalted exalted Flemish uh, burghers who uh, brought it uh, as a devoutly to the the, the, the Virgin uh, of 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 Courtrai and the mm, uh, this is also very important. I mean, the moral side of the story, right? That that is also deeply felt during the battle, uh, as we will see also with the last French reserves that get literally overwhelmed. This was shocking, as a as a result in many levels. But it's important finally to to realize as a premise the the moral effect that this victory had in the rest of Europe as well, because this was properly the first one. Right, there had been other infantries like um, the Italian and partly also the Flemish, but in different ways that had, for example, faced like for an entire day, um, I don't know, the Imperial Cavalry, for example, that was at the apex in the 13th century of, of its effectiveness, um, up to, you know, to the previous centuries, and that had boosted dramatically the confidence. I mean, th this were news that toured the world of Europe that said, what the hell, what the, how can a commoner uh, face uh, night, but uh, in all those battles, uh, it, it it was still cavalry who solved the engagement, right? That resolved the engagement. Um, so infantry was not yet decisive. Courtrai has this dramatic importance because it's the first time after a mm, couple of centuries of complete heavy cavalry uh, dominance on Western European battlefields that an infantry manages to win alone. This is the dramatic thing over cavalry. Uh, this was unconceivable um, in terms, at least in political and social terms, not that uh, the French cavalry was this stereotyped bunch of, of uh, uh, you know, haughty and, and drunken idiots that just wanted to charge whatever they, they, they saw in front of them. These were the best, the finest professionals of warfare that the time could ever produce. And they knew perfectly well what infantry was capable of. And we also have enough evidence from the Belle Courtrai itself, because it's not that they simply decided to arrive there to, to destroy. They, they thought about it very carefully. And if there was someone who knew about the potential of any uh, of any arm in, in warfare, that was the knighthood. So uh, this is unfortunately a myth, a stereotype, the fact that, you know, the French just charged because they were, they thought they were best and they didn't understand much and just to be butchered. These are mechanistic, um, positivistic and fundamentally stupid modern uh, cliches of, of people who do not understand the nature of warfare, not just um, 
uh, well, medieval times, but also their own, because let's be honest about it, very few people actually even care, um, and uh, that do not even, you know, cope with things like the fog of war, right? They, they don't consider, they need, they need to think this is essentially a video game where you can't test everything, you see what it is, it's all mechanic, it's all pre prepared, and you can scientifically say what will happen. This is not history, this is just a declaration of incompetence, and it has nothing to do with what is told to at least at some time, at some levels, because there are still, you know, historians without any specifically military historical background, which is a wholly different subject from from the rest of history as we studied uh, at university. Um, that sometimes say pretty pretty weird things, but studying this battle in its essence is precisely what we should be. That there was no uh, specific sophistication of. Um, uh, even of weaponry, right? People point out that, for example, the, the Gödendag. That, by the way, it's it's not how the, the even the the weapon was called, because this is um, this is important. The Gödendag, also known as Gödendars or Gödendag, that has an uncertain origin, and it probably doesn't mean as it's thought. And how, for example, Bilan is another very important source uh, of the battle. Um, good day. Many people trick that I've seen even, I don't know, the, well, I don't make names, where there are famous YouTubers who talk about weapons, they, 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 they said the thing. Um, it doesn't probably even mean, as ha others have hypothesized, it's good dug, or so good dug. Uh, also, that's the name how the, the, uh, through which the French called the, the weapon, because the Flemish called them Gepin de Stave, that is simply point stick. And how would you call that? And it's not even clear, actually, if you look at the Oxford Chess, for example, that what we're talking about, because there were also similar weapons that appear, like the candlesticks, etc. And no, the uh, Flemish didn't win the battle because they had the golden duck. That, we, for the sake of simplicity, we will call like this, or any other kind of uh, traumatic weapon that they could use, right? Um, that was a factor, but altogether there were many others, primarily the moral dimension. You win battles not because you have this or that weapon, but because you want to rip off the guts of the person that you find in front of you. And the person that has the greatest strength at that point is the one who wins. And what the Flemish accomplished in this battle is utterly astonishing for these, the moral standards of medieval commoners. And this is what makes actually what should make really the memory of this battle so 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 great not this again silly technologistic mechanistic obsessions of modern mindset that it, it's literally obsessed by this like I, I i have tried you know now i manage my own channel so i say whatever i want but you know if you say this to any to to, to the average right the the first thing is no, it was the weapons. No, it wasn't the weapons. Also considering that what really stopped the French cavalry is the pike, right? Uh, Gurdon ducks, halberds, axes, whatever. Do not stop. Do not stop cavalry chargers. They are ineffective. No, do, do not even quote the uh, Swiss Vosges halberd because that served to chop down knights while they were stopped. When they're stopped, when cavalry is stopped, the cavalry is idling, is battling against the, the, the surrounding enemies. It cannot defend by definition, or it can, but it's in a disadvantageous situation. That's where you, you crush a knight with a traumatic weapon like the Gödendag, that has also this point, so it's double, it's easy, it's, it's symmetrical by the way, because it has a circle section, so it's a hell of a weapon. Do not get me wrong, but it's, it does fit to that specific context, it, and also other weapons like the double hand axe of the Scots, or as we were saying, the Swiss Halbert, um, will do, right? And especially in situations that tend to, once again, be when cavalry has has been stopped, right? And for that you use the pike and the first ranks of the Flemish, as any other person would pretend to, to stop cavalry all over the world at that time had pikes, right? So even in here there is nothing specifically colorful about the thing. It, it's not the, the special weapon that made the thing done. Absolutely not. Uh, it's determination. It's this cohesion. There was also a, a broader. Uh, there was also some professional aid because, as we will see, the Flemish were actually supported here. I mean, they had knights technically, but they were virtually insignificant from a numerical point of view. In fact, 
most of them, including their commanders, dismounted to fight against uh, alongside the, the troops in the first line, which is also another dramatic b uh, boost for the moral of these people. That uh, here also we have to begin a, a huge digression of why in Flanders this was the situation, what were the, the social classes. These were essentially local knights that were fundamentally within the French, uh, you know, under the, the, the French vassalage and system of, of government, but that see fit the opportunity of, you know, autonomizing their own district through the, you know, rebellion of, of, of these commoners. Uh, these were people who had, actually, the, the ones who fought at Courtrai didn't have a dramatic military experience themselves, but broadly speaking, Flanders was in contact with many other areas uh, in, in Europe, right, um, France, uh, England, Italy, they were all deeply connected at this time. They, they were Flemish fighting here and there, mostly nobility, right? It wasn't like, I don't know, the Catalans that you find them, um, I don't know, up to Turkey and all these places uh, where were around. But the nobility, the, the guys, the professionals of warfare, they were fully European, right? They, you couldn't find them everywhere. And it was a great exchange in this regard, as professional as they find. In fact, in those situations where um, there are professionals, uh, military professionals are not noblemen. You find them equally in the same way. Um, and I, there would be a lot to add, and I hope to do it in other battle videos that I hope to make at some point. Because said like this, it sounds like it, but you don't want to, to say that this context was actually special. No, because I studied this, this reality um, for years, and what I came up with the thing is that we should be proud of the fact that Europe was dramatically homogeneous at the time, and that it's exactly this homogeneity that that actually highlights highlights the greatness of this victory. Um, otherwise, you think it is just mechanism that there were stupid people who had some tactics that were worse than others, and you know they they were defeated because there were a, a bunch of inepts. Th this is not historical, right? It, it it doesn't. There is no evidence of any sort of this stuff, right? And all what matters, as always in warfare, first and foremost, it's moral forces. First and foremost, right? You can have the best equipment, you can be the best professionals, uh, you you can have everything, but if you don't have that, or if you find someone who, is, who surpasses you in that, you will have what happened to the French at Courtrai, because that's exactly the best examples you can you could make. That's the greatness, that's the, the special nature of it. But otherwise, there is not a great deal of difference. Europe, basically, at this point, fought all in the same way, you know, where or another, and I suspect that there is, fortunately, historically speaking, I can tell you an important part uh, of... of um, of European warfare this century that has not been explained well yet, right? And I, I'm sorry I'm mysterious, I uh, say, oh, he wants to sound so expert or capable. No, it's objectively, I, I can't demonstrate to you if you give me the time, because this takes me time in, in, in real life, aside from Schwerpunkt, and I, one day I will hopefully talk about it. Now, but I can't, still can't, but I'm still, you know, advancing to you. What What's the, the, the you know, um, the context and the mindset in which we should interpret these battles. So here, I promised myself not to make too long introduction, but I had to, because these are always the, the necessary disclaimers. My objective is that if you listen to this and you hate me for it, you go away, that, that's, that's, that's better, because otherwise, you know, I, I will not just give you the, the battle immediately so that you can... Um, think that it's just the, 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 the little tale, the little story of the battle of no. Uh, I try to make history here, not story, right? Um, and um, so we can start uh, here uh, simply with the engagement, right? Uh, as always, mm, this um, these medieval battles were triggered by sieges. The ones of the Flemish army at Courtrai. Uh, it was uh, assembled by Guy of uh, Namur, right? That with shrewd and strategical and tactical insight had, together with the Flemish leaders, had chosen the best side. Why? Because basically they had cut the road to the French to the main uh, supply centers of the area. Um, at Courtrai, the Flemish army could block the road to Ghent that uh, 
was a city was not cooperating with the rebels, um, as well as one to Bruges that was blocked by them, um, and that to Ypres that was protected as well. So the French had to pass through this, and um, the the Flemish were besieging the French garrison at at uh, Courtrai, which was ill supplied. Uh, could not hold out for uh, any length of time. So the French, um, the royal army specifically, appeared outside the walls of Courtrai on July the 8th, and uh, they realized what the situation was immediately. On the 9th, the French commander ordered uh, an attack at the Tournai gate, and on the 10th, on the Lille gate, but these were not successful attempts. And on the 11th, he decided to uh, to give battle specifically against the Groningen Kuter, that where the Flemish leaders had taken up a favorable position. Um, this um, position was further reinforced by the ditches that basically were, um, I think the sources are do, do not completely agree on the origin. I mean, some were literally... Um, channels, brooks that have been opened from the, the least river, the main one, that uh, if you look at the map here that I posted, I also I will click on it so you will see it better, um, we're fundamentally at the back of the Flemish army, you see here the, the morasses and so on, um, and the, um, so you see the Grony Brook and the Great Brook uh, in English, and uh, it's a hell of a good position because it was a defensive one. When the Flemish had begun began to besiege uh, the, the castle of Courtrai, they had naturally chosen also the place in function of a possible defense, because they realized the French were there. So they actually chose this um, good standing ground that in a way surely blocked their retreat, because you see behind was the, the river. So this normally gives a boost uh, also for morale, because during the battle it's either, you know, you stand your ground or you drone uh, in, the, in the river. Um, there are not many escape r routes, but it's naturally also partially a trap. But these brooks filled with water were uh, actually lots of other ditches, uh, seemingly, that also the Flemish dug specifically, and they, they filled in water, or they covered with uh, leaves and brushes, and so on. Uh, the French actually were perfectly aware of this, so much that the French commander actually purchased for a very high value a map from a local, uh, from a local, uh, from a native, uh, a map exactly of all these ditches. So the French were perfectly aware this is nothing but you see uh, on television, they, they even showed it at the battle of, uh, what was the one, the, 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 the king, the one with the Robert the Bruce, that, you know, this avalanche of knights that keep charging to the ditches as, you know, they fall down. I said, by the way, this endless cascade of knights as if you know uh, the knights uh, had unlimited ranks and they charged it they were just normally two or three um and it's utterly ridiculous and these are still the misconception of allegedly you know accurate historical fiction which you know if you really want something historical study uh, the sources do not watch stuff on tv but unless it's artistically nice which maybe that one was i don't know i, I don't care but the, the point is do not fall into these mistakes because they do not help anyone. The, Fran the French were wholly, wholly aware of what the situation was, of what the ground was, of what they had to do to get through. And, and they even did. And they were, by the way, one step away from succeeding. Because let's also get rid um, uh, of misconceptions such as, uh, you know, the French were surprised, were charging, they didn't realize the situation, or they were simply slaughtered, you know, nothing happened. The French arrived to the very heart, they even came to, to the, the commander arrived even to, to wrap, to, to, um, to, to rip away part of the, uh, the Flemish banner, you know, they, they entered deep into Fran uh, into Flemish ranks. Uh, it was a dramatic encounter. It was extremely violent and bloody and, uh, you know, uh, uncertain result. So never think that great battles are something that are already decided because chance, the, the larger the battle is and the, uh, the, the greater, the, the, you know, the more level that the odds are. Always. So uh, we have seen it from Klaus of pretty, pretty well. Um, so... Uh, Going to the battle specifically, about 6 a.m., the call or of arms was sounded in the French camp, right? Uh, let's talk about numbers, because naturally sources are very 
you know, everybody says its own thing. Um, we know that there were 10 big units of knights and squires being formed from the French side, containing altogether about 250 nobles, right? These are the normal, you know, division, subdivisions of the army, right? They were each supported by foot soldiers, crossbowmen and bido. They were these kind of light infantry. Um, there were also, um, yeah, there were javeliners, I mean, things like these, but not all. I mean, they were buried overall. Um, a point that is rarely stressed in these battles is what exactly the role of infantry from the, let's say, the charging side, you know, from the cavalry side really was. And it was probably very important, and just sources do not speak so overtly about them, and that's also one of those aspects that should be th more thoroughly investigated in uh, European warfare because mm, I've seen pretty clearly that certain tactics that you may, may you know, see as, uh, you know, something incredible like, you know, the, the, the long bow and on, on, the, on the wings of the, uh, of the men at arms or something so I know but they, they were habitually used in certain regions of Europe uh, since at least 40 years right uh, and regularly and massively in, in, in huge battles nobody even cares because the historiography has not cared here i can't say that there is a national bias because you know i don't think you know the, the, the flemish especially have and in in uh, you know dramatically impacted the uh, the historiography of warfare with, for for nationalistic reasons i don't think so right uh, there is no um, no point uh, in this regard, but the significance of the battle in itself, especially in the broader, you know, French, in part also English reality, also considering that, that you know, I was reading, I think, De Vries that was uh, paralleling the, the battle of uh, Courtrai with, for example, Crécy in the same, in the same century. There is always this idea of, you know, reconnecting to other more famous realities that, however, are completely different in context. And let's just be aware of the fact that uh, there isn't so um, so many easy parallelisms that you can can make. These are importantly different battles, right? And Courtrai especially is unique because, ah, and by the way, this is what I didn't say. That specifically, of all the 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 infantry victories of the first half of the 14th century, it was not just the first, but the most complete, right, of all the others that came afterwards. Because the, other, the others were all a bit different. Here you have, specifically, as we will see now, yes, th there is a matter of terrain, but, and this is where I hardly agree with the Vries that says, you know, we can't say that, you know, the, the, the Flemish won this battle because of the ditches, or the terrain broadly meant. This was literally infantry, against heavy cavalry, and of course the ditches were important, and of course they played their function, but this is still about the resistance of infantry, and as far as the other battles that I observed uh, are concerned, they were either ambushes, especially in the Swiss case, um, you know, other, th there were other realities that were, mm, you know, mitigated, even by the use of other arms, and so on, you know, this is instead just, you have the Flemish, you have only infantry, only infantry, is also pretty weird, because normally other European armies didn't, Right, and actually, exactly the best ones didn't, because they were, you know, professional systems: cavalry, uh, you know, missile troops, infantry. This is just commoners. Come out from their from their shops, from their house. I mean, th that's literally it. So they're not even technically meant to be this 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 much, right? But they're pretty damn angry because they don't want to be subjugated by the French, and this is what gives them uh, strength. The Flemish army, so we have seen roughly mm, 2,500 uh, French knights, which is a lot. The Vries, if I'm not wrong, counts, because these are estimates, right? The, the, some sources say enormous stuff, like even 20,000. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, the Vries says 3,000, but, you know, I think Bruggen here is, right, 2,500, which is already big, right? An army of 2,500 cavalry. Uh, of knights specifically, and of that level, you know, by the beginning of the 14th century, it's a, it's a hell of an army. It's the big one, right? This campaign army in size. Uh, and they do not vary very much in, in Europe in, the, in this regard. Uh, the Flemish army was larger and naturally composed by different troops. They didn't even have 
nights as we've seen as a virtually you know as a significant uh, element it consisted of between 8000 to 10500 well armed foot soldiers here it's important to stress the the good equipment i mean among the various things this the guildsmen were guildsmen in fact so they could rely on their stocks and their supplies um you know the the the, the city of flanders were this florid uh, market in, in also industry centers so they had uh, some of the best equipment not that all these troops were actually um I don't know, armored, for example. No, they they were lightly armored overall, right? But they were armored in, armed in a way and deployed also in a way, um, functionally, uh, to to cope with the with the uh, with the French cavalry. And that's where the Flemish knights gave them the the uh, the right advice on how to cope with them, because those were the professional wars. A professional support they they told these commoners look you have to deploy like this you have to line up because these guys didn't literally know how to do it right or at least they knew but they would have done it fairly worse if they hadn't been specifically guided so this noble element is actually very important as a factor and it is to be found also in other contexts throughout even other infantry important infantry victories in areas also like in germany especially in the later centuries um, because it's never like either one social class or the other it's always a mix right um, there were several hundred knights and squires um, the, the royal army included the flower of the french nobility um, there was the saying at the time that 100 cavalrymen were were equal to 1,000 foot soldiers, right? Uh, 1 to 10. Sometimes it was even higher. But towards the this time, let's say things were changing, especially in this context in here, and we will see, especially in the in the midst. I mean, this may even actually be true um, as a proportion in this specific case. But also, infantrys were getting a bit more. You know, dangerous that, that they had grown during throughout the 13th century. Saint Flemish had made a lot of experimentation. They they had ambushed, butchered some noblemen in you know in effective ways, and they had therefore a century of of experience in trying to, to th even think to cope with you know to defeat them in a way. Um, the the French commander was the Count of Artois, which in this regard from a from a tactical point of view, seemed to have a considerable advantage, right? This was the elite, I mean, the, of, of the French heavy cavalry, in the number of hundreds and thousands. Um, these were just, you know, maybe 11,000 Flemish rebels from these um, commoners. We are, well, what was the deal with them? Well, there wasn't, it wasn't uh, expected uh, even a proper resistance in a way. Already the sight of the, the Flemish position probably had made the French realizing this would have been different. In fact, the Flemings had selected a very good position, which, as we have seen, enabled them to protect their flanks. Their back, as we have seen, flowed the Lys River. In front of their left wing, which was, you see that left wing from the map is, um, you know, the infantry uh, front follows these brooks, right? Um, on the left, you have the Gröningebeck, right? While the Grotebeck, the great brook, uh, protected their, uh, say, right wing or front, if you want, because you see that also their right wing technically is occupied by the, by Courtrai, is defended by it. Um, both brooks uh, definitely hampered the knight's charge. Naturally, knight's charges had to be carried out very carefully on a on a on a good ground. It, they required a lot of skill, right? That these professionals had by definition. But still, uh, a ground of this type was was not easy, even in clear, exactly for this reason. Um, the site was so well chosen from a tactical point of view that had these drawbacks, as we've seen, for which. Uh, for the Flemings, the flight was impossible. So, in a way, it was either victory or or total 
annihilation and largely death. Mm -hmm. uh, but as we've seen, the Flemish were determined. They had, they drew new great strength from the situation. Right? They had either to win or die, and they had gone there willingly. So they knew what they were doing. When the French marshals had completed their reconnaissance of of the ground, they must have assessed naturally the risks. Um, Artois decided to hold a council of war to discuss the tact the evident tactical problem of uh, an attack on such a terrain. Raoul Danel uh, pointed out the great dangers which threatened the knights once they were. Uh, fighting on the far side of the brooks because this is also the point that the French didn't uh, as in fact the battle would, would prove have much mm, problems to actually cross the brooks the problem is that it was inherently a, a difficult condition because once they had crossed um, and they did right they weren't attacked before they the, you know after they had or during the crossing right they, the thing was really having a few to be disordered in the process and having a few room of maneuvering uh, as we will see now also because the French had important missile power I mean not dramatic properly probably the one of the Flemish and, and, and the French equaled each other but surely the French seem to have used it in a more aggressive way to you know soften up the enemy ranks before the charge so it was not much about the impossibility of crossing that wasn't there it was just about what that will that entail, right? In fact, the most obvious problem was not even uh, char charging them, what, charging the Flemish, but rather what would, what would have happened if, you know, a failed charge occurred and the French had to come back and recross the brooks. That would have been even more complicated and would have exposed the knights, now, especially during a, a rout or, or a retreat, however, to the Flemish pressure. That is incidentally exactly what ha would happen. Um, so Raoul Danel suggested the uh, to, to lure essentially the Flemings out of their good position, right? Which was a, a good idea in a way. Um, Jean de Bourla, who was Grand Master of the Crossbowmen, wanted to harass the Flemish with his light foot soldiers, hoping to inflict such great losses on them that they would have to give way right so this was a good plan you know you're asked them consider also the here it's in july was hot so these uh, these are not professional i mean the flemish are not professionals of war they they are loading weapons uh they stay under the sun it, it's it's exhausting after a day it's not a, a matter of saying you know well, uh, can't you you know have you never spent a day outside you're always making videos you don't know it's <laughs> staying under the sun well it's very different. Here you have the anxiety, the adrenaline. You have the the weight, the, uh, the simply the fear. You, you you're worn out and staying under the sun in July, right? You know, even in Flanders, it's actually not that pleasant, after all. Um, the French, uh, in this regard, had some advantage to exploit. Um, once the Flemish had been tired. Down the knights would deliver the coupe de grâce avec la charge. I, I completed the, <laughs> the phrase in French, uh, but it's it was literally it, right? And normally, uh, feudal warfare was about this, right? You know, in this case, it's different because you don't have other knights to to fight against. But even in a clash between knights, it's not about the, the full charge uh, of of all the uh, your your mounted mass at once it's about testing the enemy line with this kind of tournament like engagements back and forth etc then you you spot the weaker area and then you launch uh, yourself with the forces that are uh, spared at that point to, to try to break uh, the enemy line which is always very risky because you could even fail that so this was a bit in the same way Godfrey of Brabant thought it was wiser instead not to attack at all, right? So already somebody had pointed out in in the council that the situation was riskier than it seemed, probably, um, and uh, the alternative was, as we've seen, rather to wear the Flemings down by making them stand all day 
in battle order with their heavy equipment on, without food or drink, on a hot July day, right? You you can't have you know I don't know boys that pass with, with drinks with, with what you know the knights have the squires etc. But in order to make these guys restore, you have to break the wall formation. You have to make them eat and drink and so on. So this was um, actually a good plan, as we've seen. Um, and uh, the the point was not even it was about not even giving battle on on the eleventh, but to exhaust them so much that the following day on the twelfth, the Flemish would have simply not even dared to fight, and uh, maybe their forces would have started to to melt away. Yet uh, the majority of the council thought that the battle should be fought at once. And in here, there would be to analyze all the sources for the battle. Now, uh, there is, uh, for example, De Vries, and that's what I don't like so much of that account. So he insists very much on the fact that this French just wanted to charge because they were a holy, right? Um, no, right. We don't. Also, the French, as we've seen, actually had problems of supplies out here and there. So th it was important for them in this situation to to conclude the battle quickly, right? Uh, maybe I don't know. This was their the cause of their uh, defeat, but we cannot know by definition what were the what was the pressure that logistics posed to them at this point. So uh, other you know here there might have been properly the mis misjudgments on the nature of the Flemish forces specifically because sure it is of this battle that the French underestimated like everybody in in the world at that point the existence of these commoners it was normal it was not a specific character of any other night you know this is not about French or Flemish this is what the normality was throughout all of Europe Western Europe at least um, the Flemish commanders instead William of Ulich Guy of Namur and uh, John of Rennes placed their heavy foot soldiers far away from the brooks to minimize the effect of the French crossbowmen's attack. At the same time, leaving only a small space in which the French knights could develop their assaults on the Flemish side of the brooks. So, as we were saying before, um, first of all, the first lines were composed by the heavy foot soldiers, which means uh, in this sense uh, not heavy in the sen necessary sense of armor, in part, in part surely yes, I mean there were surely some armored uh, commoners at this point armored in sense of, you know, heavy you know, um, armored like coat of mail uh, even some plate appearing at this point actually, so the infantry could wear it, the, we know that the word knights were dismounting there, so they surely had it in part but here by heavy infantry we're talking about literally by definition the infantry that can withstand uh, uh, a cavalry attack. Light infantry is what cannot do, which is the majority of the other infantry was behind and um, also the, the missile troops uh, as we will see also in, in action in a while. Uh, this is a normal type of deployment, right? Uh, every infantry at the time was organized internally in this way. What's important here is that the, uh, of course the pikes were in the front as also it would have been the normality. The armor was as we've seen in the front because that was to take the blows not just of the knights swords uh, but of the uh, you know also the missiles. They they would have not taken you know the uh, you know the, the, the blunt of, of the pike because the of, of uh, the cavalry ranks because at this point uh, in in Western warfare let's say that pikes and cavalry lances are racing one against the other so they were mostly the same length right so it's not much about where you will be hit by the lance but how cohesive you stay and you can you know nullify virtually the effect if you are the, 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 the let's say the stronger side um, but of course the French knights wouldn't just charge with the lance once they stop they would draw out this sword and uh, and start hitting pretty damn hard as they would and the French uh, excuse me and the Flemish on foot equally now with 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 weapons that as we've seen like the good and dark but also other um, other uh, uh, traumatic let's say blunt weapons I don't know say in English um, to properly attack 
with this, um, the good in that is is good because you, as we've seen before, you can both uh, pierce and smash quite quickly and easily. Um, so you know that against armor, that you know, it's mostly uh, you can't really break it. You, it's too much force that you need. Uh, I mean, you can you can accomplish that, but it's not what you're looking for to do. It's better to traumatize the you know the the body underneath. So that's technically the, the effectiveness of it. Right. Uh, so naturally, the Flemish ranks were pretty exposed, so that you have in front of the pike to stop the charge, and behind immediately. Uh, immediately, I mean, the, even the the ranks were not dramatically deep. Uh, I wouldn't know how much there would have been eight or some other would have made mass. Usually, behind these forces, there were also literally disarmed people. Right? It could be anyone, like the cooks, you know, the, the children, even the women. Surely, there's been, uh, you know, these armies were. Uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, had their subtler chain and all this stuff. So to make mass, which is just a psychological effect, then eventually these people will do nothing in combat, but they will show that. But the, the fighting ranks are, you can think, eight, right? The, I mean, the, the files of where the, the, the line of which uh, they're in depth constitute the, the unit, right? So first the pikemen, then immediately these guys armed with the but the thing is, when the cavalry is being uh, stopped, or you know the, the knight is falling, you go against them. Even outside the ranks, sometimes you find it in other battles, and a smash against the heavily armored guy. Um, but not even this, as we have seen, is mechanically what had the uh, the Flemish victory done. It was mostly about their courage, right? Their determination. They're willing to kill or get killed. Uh, so, evidently, the Flemish fear French crossbow fire because they deploy their troops behind the brooks. They're, they don't, do not stand over the brook to await for the cavalry charge. Uh, they distance themselves because they fear the crossbow bolts. And they just leave this uh, room, even for the French to come in across the the brook, but not giving them enough space eventually to, to maneuver in that situation. Uh, this is important because even to carry out a cavalry charge you need this room, right? You don't, you have to go back and forth, so it, it's complicated to do it when you don't have much maneuver. Or there is crucial in these charges. So if that is uh, lowered, there is an enormous risk for everybody. Um, the um, Flemish naturally had to wait their opponents in a motionless defensive position. That's how you cope with cavalry. You stay pretty damn firm, idle. You stay there, you even plant the pike on the ground. You just have to be thi as thickly compact as you can. Right. This is quite important, also because you increase simply the, the if you increase the thickness of the front, you have more pikes per whatever, uh, you know, the length of the perimeter is. And that is a multiplication of defensive and eventually also offensive power in, in point. On the Flemish right wing, let's say, actually on the Great Brook, um, the men of Bruges stood behind the brook, specifically under the command of William of Ulich. In the center were the men from the Franc of Bruges and the West Flanders, partly behind the Grotebeck and partly behind the Groningenbeck, and on the left wing, Guy of Namur commanded the men of the region of Alost, Odenard, and Courtre, and the men of Ghent. Right. The right flank was protected by the uh, Lage uh, Vivier, I do not pronounce it, or Lower Moat. Right. The uh, left flank by the monastery of Groningen. This, this is very important because it makes you understand also what these battlefields practically were, right? And don't think that pitch battles were fought in particularly different realities from this, where there was a ditch, uh, a building, farms, all this stuff, fences, right? And so on. John of Rennes waited uh, with a reserve corps behind the center, this is like competing to match all the masses. It may also be counterproductive. Also, you need this reserve card for, for intervening. I don't know if there is a breach somewhere. You need to fill it. 
also consider that there is the French garrison in the castle that can sally forth, and and they will do that. They will make a sortie during the um, during the battle. Uh, the communal army of Ypres had to attend, in fact, the castle garrison in check, and also to guard the rear of the Flemish formation in turn as a as a reserve. Right. So they had outlined this. It's a good uh, deployment indeed. Um, both armies deployed well, right? Nobody made a specific mistake in this regard. The Flemish still waited a, a long time for the French to attack, and this would increase their um, their their anxiety. They were nervous, surely, restless, apprehensive. You have to think that you are literally a no one, because a commoner is by definition a no one. They had to face, to literally face, face to face, the finest warriors in the entire Western Europe. Uh, this is not like, I don't know, these guys were, ah, oh, yeah, we will defeat them. No, no, they freaked out. The, the sources tell us they were scared like hell. And would, would have not been. Do you think the French were not scared? Everybody is scared before a battle. right? It, here it counts, naturally, how much you cope with that fear. And the Flemish did pretty damned well in this regard. Surely the French did well too. Um, the, um, there was also no way out. This is another thing that we have seen before. Uh, as the French moved, uh, you realized that it was impossible to leave the battlefield. Like, just imagine it psychologically speaking. You, st you stay in one of those ranks, um, you're tired, it's hot, you're thirsty, you're ready, you have, maybe you haven't slept at night, because who, who does sleep before a battle? Um, you can't die the day, the, the day after. And you're just w fixing with your eyes, uh, you know, saying a bit of bullshit with your, you know, your, your comrades, then, you, but you're fixed and polarized, that is for uh, relieving this tension, but you're you're focused on the French you find in front of you, because you know that when though because you unconsciously hope they will get away, that some miracle will happen. You may, may maybe truly believe in miracles, uh, and uh, what a miracle this battle was objectively. And you see these guys mount, right? Because uh, knights mounted just. Um, Let's say not immediately before the charge, but I mean they, they didn't they tend the, especially in this case as they had the initiative not to mount much before they would actually charge because that would tire the horses the the same men etc. So you see these guys mounting, they're they're already they they you know they line up, and you know that it's over because they are attacking. So there is no way out of this but through a bath of blood. Right, and this is terrifying. I, we have explained. Um, this is, I, you know, sometimes I get boring, but uh, this is perhaps one of the best battles to to quote this anecdote. When the maid, you would think a cavalry charge is okay. Well, it's just a cavalry charge. No, a cavalry charge is something that if it happens to you once, you will never forget it. Not even in your deathbed. Right? It's something so traumatic that even veterans of modern wars are were were. Terrified by them when they shot the movie Waterloo in the, in the seventies, um, the one with Roth Steiger. That was a um, um, Western Eastern Bloc uh, cinematographic cooperation. So much that uh, the the Red Army provided for the uh, essentially for the the mass of, of background actors, and th there wasn't computer effects at the time. So all those beautiful scenes that you see are all real people, and. Um, when they had to shoot the um, the British squares receiving the charge of the French cuirassiers, it's so another beautiful scene. We have accounts of these people that were literally sometimes the veterans of the Eastern Front who had attacked, you know, that they had uh, fought against the Nazi panzers barehanded. These people, even in front of the charge, of all that mass of horses was naturally a fake charge that they knew rationally would stop. These were veterans of the Eastern Front. They couldn't hold the line. 
I mean, a cavalry charge is one of the most single devastating experience in the history of mankind. Uh, it's it's something unspeakable. Uh, and what happens at Courtrai should be read in these terms. These are not guys who think, ah, oh, now we're knocking down because we have the pike and the gun and that, right? Ah, oh, we found the right combination. It's no. This, these guys are freaking out badly because the best they can do is just to remain where they are and that's the greatest challenge they will face throughout the whole battle because you don't stand your ground while you have French cavalry charging straight at you. And we know the horrible things that happened in the front ranks during this fight, right? A nightmare. Um, the, just think about, just, but the forces involved just for saying once, right? Uh, this was as gruesome as you can imagine. The, uh, on the Flemish right wing, the men of Bruges stood crucial in this situation were the noble leaders of the Flemish, who uh, had sent away their own horses and as knights, right? Consider this, it's not the, the, these knights actually gave a damn about the commoners. They they considered them some disgusting slobs, like any true aristocrat would think of any commoner at the time. Um, but they knew perfectly well that they had to give them an example, that they had to believe in them, right? Because that was their own thing. Too. So they sent away their own horses. Think about what this means. And this is an area that was fundamentally, as we've seen, it was technically part of, of France, right? These were, it was being fought by these aristocrats instead of that broadly feudal, you know, European culture, but it was fundamentally very close to France um, at any levels. It's difficult even to draw a separation. The identity here is complex, but the aristocracy would surely also want to prove the 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 effectiveness of uh, their of, of infantry in, in advance by essentially even lying because what the hell did they know how this thing would have handed in, to to the corner saying you know look at this point we are so few knights that they they thought that uh, you know we, we deploy uh, among the the men and we make them see that we share their own uh, their own cause and that's that's what boosted dramatically the commoners morale um, this is really mm, very, very important, right? A, a nobleman sharing the lot of the common man. Consider that all these nobles were volunteers. They had joined the revolt, right, and guided it. Um, so they, they surely, they, they had all the motivation for this measure, right? Uh, there were peasants, too. Right, uh, that were also pretty. Damn, you know, the peasants are historically speaking probably the single most uh, radically violent uh, section of society by all standards. Uh, these were the ones who suffered all the worst, um, you know, oppressions, privations, crimes. Um, you know, the, 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 even the commoners of the city were, were a step. Above them, in fact, the commoners actually spit on these people as much, if not more, actually. And this is a real historical thing than the aristocrats did on uh, uh, on these others, on the commoners. Um, literally, there were people there who were fighting for their lives because they knew, for example, the men of Bruges that would have been immediately next. I mean, they everything was at stake there. Their their freedom, yes, but that concretely means your life, the one of uh, of your of your family, and so on. William of Ulich and Guy of Namur encouraged their men. Together with the nobles and the heads of the guilds, they drew up their men in battle array. At last, Guy uh, of Namur and William of Ulich addressed the troops, while John of Rennes, commander of the reserve, explained how he was to rush to the help of the long battle formation uh, giving excellent advice in the middle because we hear there is this quote. Um, this is I don't know from whether the Annales Candenses or the Chronicon Comitum Flandrensium says, "Do not allow the enemy to break through your ranks. Do not 
allow the enemy to break through your ranks. Do not be afraid. Right? This is not rhetoric. This is literally what they must do. Right? Kill both men and horse. The Lion of Flanders is our battle cry. When the enemy attacks the corpse of Lord Gui, we shall come to your help from behind. Anyone who breaks into your ranks or gets through them will be killed. Right? This is this is a speech, right? Because it, it's it's literally what they had to do. This was the guy who, who guided the, the reserve and that had eventually to, to hurry up, as will happen actually, in in the uh, part of on in hell, to the help of the part of the line that the enemy would have broken through in case it would have happened, and that's exactly what doesn't have to happen, must not, and cannot happen, because if that happens, the whole freaking, freaking line crumbles, right? Um, it was also given out that no one should collect booty, and that anyone who did so, who surrendered or fled, would be killed at once. Also, no prisoners were to be taken. So this is crystal and clear. If the guys step into the formation, you kill them. Right? There is no way out. Humans are not made technically to kill each other. They're, they're made to you know, shout at each other, to punch in their chest, throw some rocks. They rarely kill each other. They, na they rarely close the, the distance. Um, it's in that when you think people that say war is, 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 is natural, it's primitive. No, it's one of the most artificial things that, however, is still one of the most human things ever because nobody does it in this sense so it counter it's heavily counter instinctive men do not make war because they're animals make men war because they are men and because they're freaking damn motivated to do something that will risk to have them killed and these guys are are even doing it them for free and by the way you know for free in the sense that they really believe in the cause right so it's not even about the imposition but even if it was about the imposition if you don't if someone has no motivation you cannot even have an army in that regard so you kill these freaking people if they arrive, right? And the, the, the mere idea, that these are not people, it's as if there were two different races of beings, right? You know, one is the commoner, one is the, 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 the noble knight. You're not equals, right? There is even a, a kind of mm, crypto-racial discrimination in all this. The, the, the knights truly believed they were biologically superior to these other people, and, and, and the others thought to be inferior. This is what makes this, this battles astonishing, these victories of infantry in this period, and Courtrait was the first one that inspired everybody, that exalted to the stars these people. Because nobody had believed for centuries that a commoner could, could even, you know, confront with uh, an aristocrat on the field. It was not that, you know, these people embraced the ideology of their own inferiority, but it, the inferiority was so evident, because those guys were, were covered in iron. They, they trained their whole life exclusively to kill other human beings like you. And what the hell do you do? You, you face them in battle? These people do it. And this is the thing. This is the single most important thing about the Battle of Courtre and similar ones, as they will start happening more frequently. This is a great path opener. Right. Um, also, if you f freaking abandon the post, I will kill you myself. So discipline is a real thing, right? Also, in these times of pandemics, you know, we should reteach a lot of people discipline, but not with words, but with baton, right? Because humans are also pretty coward beings. So if you threaten them with violence, they will they will obey, right? Um, this is exactly how you lead an army, because. That's where you need discipline. When you risk someone's life, including, you know, not just your own, but others, you should be threatened of, of death if you do not obey to the rules, right? Um, this is what um, our alleged, you know, advanced times has, um, you know, make it, made us forgotten, that nobody cares about you. You live among lots of other people, and if there is something that you have to do, you will do it. Otherwise, someone will come and will smash you. Right? This is probably the unique moment you know, in which I regret not to live in, in a dictatorship, because in a dictatorship, at least people would obey in that regard. Um, 
but unfortunately we have softened up in such a disgusting way that you, you would even you know uh, you know start uh, distrusting your your democratic values <laughs> otherwise believe me really I don't um, so Guido of Namur knighted uh, Peter de Koning and and uh, his two sons in front of the Flemish armies was also a, a normal practice and this was done also for uh, about 30 of the leading citizens of Bruges so this is a political move right a political and social one that shows these commoners that if they win they will have in part at least their leaders will have a place in the aristocracy right in the nobility proper this is another, another great propaganda move by the Flemish that works then the two princes sent their horses away as we've seen and armed like the rebels with the visorless helmet of the communal soldiers not even the great helm right that was at this point uh, become the norm right they took their place in the front rank grasping a pike or a godentag like the commoners great great move so we know that fighting broke out between crossbowmen a little before noon uh, both armies had archers I mean you know crossbowmen whatever um, and this was normal uh, for just like uh, in, in the ancient world to skirmish before the battle to, to test right it was not done much to actually cause high quant quantities of victims um, and perhaps not even to hope to literally soften up the enemy ranks um, enough right this was not an intensive fire in a way it's, it's just to test the resistance in, indirectly test the resistance of the enemy however the uh, French missiles were superior in numbers to the Flemish who thus slowly gave way uh, the French cavalry was at close distance from uh, their own missiles and um, the French arrows reached the front ranks of the main Flemish lines but apparently without serious effect right uh, at the time there is no missile unit that can eliminate alone cavalry or infantry right it's always about combined tactics and this was just as we've seen to taste the uh, taste and test there is a resistance of the Flemish um, the uh, the infantry I mean the you know the, the Malay troops also advanced you know Malay infantrymen of the French advanced they reached the um, the Greninge and uh, Grote brooks but they were called back by Artois who was afraid that they would be overwhelmed on the far side on the far side by the Flemish heavy foot soldiers while the French knights could not support their own troops some sources make the, the moral point that the the French knights didn't want the, the you know that allegedly the French infantry was doing well against the Flemish but they, that the French cavalry was jealous so uh, Artois uh, decided to to have them retreated this is a bit filmsy like uh, explanation um, they could have not made it uh, frankly at that point um, and there was on the contrary a, a real risk that the uh, the Flemish could at some point break the French infantry so that this could have not eventually helped the same French knights right even in here it's not it was just about the, the charge of the cavalry charge there were still infantry fighting alongside the knights in a way that we don't fully un uh, understand unfortunately because sources normally do not talk about this I should reread them all but from the accounts we don't have this clear uh, picture um, and the, the point of this is also that the especially the missile troops would maintain the Flemish distance from the brooks right the main problem was actually this probably that um, the, the French needed those troops to maintain fire on the brooks so to dislodge the uh, you know not to make the Flemish uh, reapproach them so that the French uh, charge would have 
become impossible, right? Uh, the, the Flemish already knew that, so probably uh, the situation was just to make the, the Flemish retreat a bit or see how, you know, as we've seen, testing the, the solidity of their line. Uh, also, it's pretty much obvious that it, infantry, uh, you know, you have to get rid of it if you want to carry out the charge, right? Uh, you, you have to have full space of maneuver for cavalry so these foot soldiers uh, we don't know how they advance but we don't even know whether it was a continuous line in that regard so any suggestion like ah uh, you know the French were wrong these were the most competent military leaders of the time what the hell do you know in the 21st century about how people actual people of the time fought like and you think you are better than them? No. Right? So, let's be honest about these things. Um, so, by beginning the assault quickly by the nobles, uh, the French at the same time would profit by the preparatory shooting of the crossbow. So, Artois gave the order of the infantry to come back um, while the banners were moved to the front uh, of, the, 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 of, of the knights. They came uh, uh, out of the ward forward, right? Seven French cavalry units riding to the brooks with the banners unfurled. Right? This is really the moment in which that's it, right? They send in heavy cavalry. The left wing of the French, commanded by Raoul de Nel, attacked the uh, Flemish across the Grote Brook. It consisted of four bands of knights. These were, so, as we've seen, roughly 1,000 cavalry. The right wing had three bands of knights and advanced to the Groning instead, so on the uh, Flemish left. The foot soldiers managed to get out of the way of the cavalry. We have seen even, you know, there are other famous battles, like think about um, Crecy, you know, the, the French cavalry allegedly by the way, running over the Genoese crossbowmen after they had failed, but you know there was a you know full cooperative way of managing these troops that also costed, and um, you know yeah the the the, the discipline made of these knights and they were high nobility they could do whatever they liked in a way, but also why would they do it? Right, it's kind of silly, right? Um, and um, some men, however, seemingly did not heard the order, or stumbled in their haste, others were trampled by the armored knights, right? But most of them were able actually to retreat through the spaces between the knights' units or along the flanks. So at this point came the, the crucial moment for the French as well, because as we've seen it was not about carrying out the charge straight away, they had to cross the ditches, which is what they began to do. Um, they mm, they did it quickly, um, prob probably hastily, because they feared, naturally, a, a Flemish attack during the crossing, that, as you know, is one of the mo single most delicate moments uh, in military maneuvers. So, naturally, they had to cross and to partly re or reform uh, on the other side. Uh, the Flemish wouldn't abandon their post. Uh, surely, I mean, you could, if you had a camera looking all over the, the perimeter of this, we would see single troopers who would, you know, individualistically say, okay, well, we'll launch an attack here and there. Because, you know, here the adrenaline, like, you're so nervous that sometimes the, the actual fight is better than the weight of it. And something that World War the First veterans knew sadly pretty well. But that already at the time was the same. The same goes for the cavalry charges. There is someone's nerves, especially the younger, inexperienced knights that have been maybe just knighted. They want to prove their value. They, they freak out, however, and they, they, they f launch themselves full gallop. And not only they get, you know, you know, killed because they do not charge in formation, but they also endanger the unity of the whole line, because of the whole unit, because they, they have abandoned their post. So they were very you know, skilled uh, veterans, the the Rotmeisters that were at the head of these formations that would keep the order during the charge as well. 
right and skilled uh, expert equestrians that would do that um, or at this point some horses missed their jump or stumbled others refused to cross as well and had to be forced to jump uh, also knights fell from their saddles in both to both the brooks um, but on the wall the crossing was successful the important was here for the Flemish to have in part already disordered the enemy formation it wasn't decisive by itself as we've seen the ditches were not decisive the battle was not won because of the ditches they just helped the left wing was the first unit ready for an attack on the opposite side of the Grote back after quickly reorganizing the formations the constable charged the right wing and part of the Flemish center with his own four units of knights right so the attack begins the melee begins properly on the uh, great brook line the Flemish archers at this point had retreated um, uh, behind the main battle line I mean this is the function of, the, of skirmishers fundamentally and under Jean de Bourlat, Godfrey of Brabant, Raoul de Nel and the two marshals the French knights rode at quick trot with Couchet lances towards the Flemings. Charges were carried out normally at uh, you know 40-45 kilometers per hour canter mostly full gallop was avoided but you could also like the last 100 meters and here the spaces are fairly narrow right so they still carry that out but and that's exactly what what they have distanced the Flemish lines for with the, with the missile troops um, and you can imagine the tension here it, it's unspeakable um, the because both the Flemish and the French were, were astonished nobody had none of them had actually experienced what what was about to happen because the Flemish had never been tested right in such a critical nerve-wracking way um, under this overwhelming pressure um, as we were saying before it's terrifying to, to just to hear the, 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 the sound of the, the, the hundreds of knights galloping against you and seeing them approaching and knowing that they will not stop because they're going to impact all the way through right uh, the myth that that uh, horror, you know, that, that cavalry does not charge in front of the block, it's wrong, right? They did, they did as hell, right? Horses generally don't. Horses generally stop, even just in front of you know dead bodies on the ground or things like this. But some are more angry than others, like especially stallions, and that's exactly what they are chosen in that function. Were the heaviest, the bulkiest, the, the beefiest beasts. We know that horses sometimes crush themselves, breaking bones, the, even uh, you know along fences and so on. So they, there would be a selection of the, of the horses that would make that, and mostly uh, it's the knights uh, that um, that that would maybe hold, right? It, but the horse would do that generally, right? And generally speaking, you, it, this is also not a wall. This is people. So. The horse, the horse is a very intelligent animal, as you know, and they they do understand this. That they they have seen partly things like this before. They know what they have to do. They are also the, they they feel they are all together. They, they feel they are with their masters. They they will charge into the thing, and they they did as hell as they did. Um, as we were seeing before, here Verbruggen says that the Flemish pikemen fixed their weapons um, in the ground. Um, you know the the pike is held with two arms at least. Um, the uh, even with the shield is possible because if you slung it um, uh, over your uh, along your neck and on, the, on your left shoulder, you can hold both pike and shield. And this is how seemingly pikemen basically fought. Um, the man with the good and axe and other um, blunt weapons uh, were in, in the behind them, ready to strike. Um, because the 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 the, the, ca the cavalry would break like into multiple points, so it wasn't about if you had even just two or three people in front of you, they they could be smashed away by the right charger, let's say. But the fr so this was hallucinating. We had the, but the French lived um, pretty 
damn and bitter uh, uh, surprise in the same way, if not more, because they were used as knights to charge against formations so that would break. Right, it was normal as we've seen here and there to have infantry would, would withstand the uh, the cavalry charges, but to be broken and to be especially supported by other cavalry to avoid that in the process, this was not the case. This was pure infantry, right? A few cavalry running around, maybe yeah, just you know looking from the above of the horse, the situation, the commanders, the the, the messengers. Yeah, right. But this is entirely infantry, right? So what sur dramatically surprises the French is that they in do impact this line, but the line holds. It largely holds. These guys are not breaking. And this is exactly, I, I mean, you can imagine all what the, the part of these knights themselves feared, like as we have seen at the council said, but, you know, will we have enough room and space to charge? And what does happen if we charge these guys that do, do not break and what the hell do we do? We're trapped. We have the ditches behind. This guy is massively in the front. If cavalry stops, it cannot defend by definition. So what the hell do we do? Uh, we have to dismount and we are way less than them. So we are done for. Right? So this is the mess. Right? Uh, this French noble freaked out. They had never seen anything like this. And they had seen a lot, believe me. These guys had seen it all before. Yet, this one, they had never seen it. And nobody in Western Europe from 200 years had seen it. Right? The um, weavers, the fullers, the artisans, the peasants, th these were the Flemish. Right? This is the difference we were saying before. You know, If you look at, at, at an Italian commune, for example, those had the knights on their own. I mean, but true ones, not merchants dressed up like knights. They had fully professional troopers. They used in their armies. They were complementary. All the, the arms were integrated. These were just a bunch of civilians with weapons in their hands. It was nothing like it. This is the incredible thing. This is the really incredible thing. And these are even very gentrified people. This is not. These are not the rough Scottish infantry, right? This is not the rough Swiss, um, you know, uh, farmers. Um, her that, that that are borderline between peasants and 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 uh, commoners. These are these are people that really do not leave war for more than much, right? And yet these guys do not flee; they stay courageously at their post. Other very important thing in here is that when you carry out the charge, it's not that you can't stop. We've seen before you're part of a close. Uh, formation, you you cannot escape, right? Uh, here, every unit is testing uh, the resistance of the enemy. They're trying their best. There is also a competition, at least to say, let's be the ones that break first, right? And they will even accomplish it in, in some parts of the line, in fact. But the point is that you can you do not stop, right? Those those infantrymen are freaking out, but think of what it means to launch yourself at 40, 45 kilometers per hour. By the way, with all the momentum um, uh, and, and, and inertia, or, uh, consequently, of, of, of you, your horse, uh, smashing through these guys' lines, and, you know, risking to impale yourself, literally, and uh, to be overthrown, to break your bones. I mean, we, we know of horrible things uh, happening in here. Uh, so, some nights would actually slip away before they impacted. I mean, of course, this is no perfection, but literally the most of them just crushed into... And this is literally the the, 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 the utter violence of this reality, right? It's, it's, let's be honest, it's, it's as if you had to stop a, a motorcycle running against you, uh, over you. It, it's, it's dramatic. It's dramatic. You, you, you destroy yourself. The guy over it destroys itself. That's exactly how it happens. Also... These charges are naturally repeated uh, in part because that's fundamentally what the, you know, if you fail first and there is still enough cohesion, the unit is still, you know, uh, you stop, you, you come back and you uh, line up once again. And but, but it's difficult in this situation, of course. Um, here, just think about the noise, the confusion, the uh, the, it's unspeakable. The most important thing is that the men of Bruges withstand the charge. 
they inflict heavy losses on the French nobility already. Godfrey of Brabant uh, knocks down William of Ulich and hurls the prince's banner to the ground. This is dramatic because, you know, the ban if the banner falls, it's you, you literally lose uh, orientation. You don't know, you know, if that falls, it's because the the enemy has gotten that deep into the line and he, among the best troopers because of course the commanders would be also escorted by the finest um, troops so but um, after breaking into the bourgeois ranks the uh, Godfrey was brought down himself and killed Raoul Donnell also fell in the initial charge right so these are the guys who actually were saying look let's try to be you know let's be cautious these are the same guys that eventually charge straight into uh, the mid as a proof that literally uh, it's either you do this or you do not do or you don't do anything right there is not other way with cavalry to to fight against the enemy so the same guys were saying let's not do it are the ones that when they're forced to do it they do it at the fullest and they're even taken down so this speaks for the necessity of that mechanism and the highest moral superiority of, of these individuals, right? Because nobody would do that. Uh, a commoner wouldn't have the same courage to do it. They wouldn't have the same political and social burden to be obliged to do it, right? If you are a French nobleman, that's exclusively what you're expected to, to be the first one to launch yourself against whichever enemy you, you meet, right? Even given, of course, that there is still a, a tactical, strategical logic, you can't do it all the time, but when you do it, this is exactly what you do. Otherwise, you don't do it, or otherwise you're, you're, you will be a coward for the rest of your life. And yet, this is literally functional to make the charge as effective as possible. And this, this, wor this probably was, right? The French actually did pretty well considering they had to cross the ditches to reform, to maintain cohesion, they they go pretty damn close to break this phalanx. Right? Because also, how, how would you win? There is no other way. That was the right one. The exactly right one. Right? And this is also when the, you know, after the impact, as we've seen, is devastating, the hand-to-hand -hand melee ensues. And this is also pretty damn ugly as well, right? This is when the golden dags are at use, uh, falling both on men and horses with utter violence. Um, you know, this is really the mess because, uh, I mean, the, the cavalry doesn't have as I mean, as much as they have entered as a wedge into the the enemy ranks, they they also have now how to fight somewhat individually, or at least, of course, the cohesion is always maintained, but it's it's a pretty freaking mess, so the individual uh, capacity here is, starts being heavy, right? We can be, you know, the the, the the knights themselves be equipped in this regard with the right weapons to, um, to, to cope with the lightly armored infantry, as most of these guys were. For example, the falchions, they're sometimes associated with a kind of a the peasantry actually was were mostly used by knights because they were the only ones who could close at a distance uh, with that short weapon, but be enough armored first of all to to, to use it in in that uh, in that sense, but also to meet uh, enough lightly armored troops because the falchion doesn't cut through armor. We know it, uh, and uh, so this was just for literally butchering people with light armor, right? with cabins, with you know. Uh, which is which are all, which are also pretty good by themselves, by the way. But literally, this is when it starts being butchery. I mean, plain and pretty good butchery. Right? If you go to a butcher, that that's exactly you know how these guys were trained to. I mean, in other ways, of course, but that's what they have to do. The objective here is to kill the human being. In the most horrifying way, because the, the guy is not going to be killed so easily so you literally have to go physically there today we pull a trigger we make some person's brain blowing up at 200 meters uh, of course we train our troops to, to do it the same you know uh, gut opening but with knives and all but you know these guys did it on a regular base in a world where this was done in an, on the regular base human botchers right and 
and the French are pretty damn good at that as well. These are knights. These are the peak of professionalism. They, they are trained to fight with every single possible imaginable weapon you can ever find, ever. Including crossbows, everything, everything. Not in this case, maybe crossbow. But these are the, the finest troopers in absolute terms from an individual point of view and also collective point of view. But this is the point. They are put in a condition of disadvantage by, you know, pouring through a mass of enemies, overwhelmingly superior in numbers, probably in part also dismounted, because uh, at that point, if the, as we have seen, cavalry stands, that, that it's risky even to keep fighting on horseback. Some would be trapped under the horses when they, were, they had fallen. Um, others would be even killed on horseback, presumably. But uh, I presume most of them, on the long run, would try even just to to abandon their, their mounts, because um, if, uh, at least for fighting in the single moment, right, not because their mount, I, I mean, preferably they would try to maintain it to run away from the enemy, but the the the, the space here is pretty, is pretty narrow, so uh, what are the odds, right, and so it, it's literally dramatic, and that's what puts the enemy into the, the condition of, of disadvantage that the Flemish were looking for, right, even when, if still risking to be defeated because the Flemish went a step away from being defeated right um, in the center also the French knights draw deep into the ranks of the men of the Franc of Bruges some of these yielded in fact others however manfully stood their ground as well right so this is where the situation gets pretty damn serious because th there are huge gaps open so here the cavalry still has uh, room to perform even certain feats collectively, so it, it's very, very serious. The heavy cavalry carried on their attack and penetrated deeper into the Flemish lines. Right? That's where the breakthrough seemed likely. And if you, you, they break through, it's over. It's over for the Flemish. Right? Um, a number of, of them, in fact, starts fleeing. Some infantry and Abandoned post said, they, "Okay, the French broke through. Hell, I'm out of here. Uh, I'll risk to drown in in the river, I, whatever. But I am out of here. I don't want to stand here anymore." Um, meanwhile, the French right wing charged across the Groningen back, as we have seen. The charge was made in dense units. This is what you want to do to be more, you know, punching equally all over the line, and you know, so to, to weaken the, the wall think at once because the point is not delivering this force in um, let's say um, at uh, you know gradually it's delivering it all in one big shock which at parity of force employed has a much greater psychological effect so that you really want these guys to break that's what you have to do um, and they they had also less commotion than the, Fr the, the, the French left wing. Uh, th there was a tremendous force uh, uh, with which the knights hurled themselves against the East Flemish, but these resisted stoutly, and the cavalry were checked. Right, and even in here, uh, violent hand-to-hand -hand fighting followed. So this is perhaps the the place where uh, the, uh, the 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 both both sides actually fought the hardest, in a way. Um, and while heavy fighting developed along the wall front, Jean Delain made a sortie from Courtre Castle to attack the Flemish from the rear. Right. This is the culminating point of the offensive. So this is where the French are punching the hardest. It's exactly the moment that everybody in the castle garrison is waiting to set forth. Because that's where you can hope to put your force combined with the others at best use. And the garrison um, seeks, first of all, to divert the attention of the men of Ypres by setting fire to a fine house on the market square as well. So you hear how com composite the, actually the picture is, because this is around Courtre, so it's not a desert outside. It's full of uh, you know houses, farms, etc. So that's, that's, that's normality, uh, which also these 
the, you know, medieval warfare was was being fought most of the times. But the Flemish remain alert near the castle gate, and they successfully beat off the attack. Right, so the French sortie from Courtrai is checked. They cannot intervene against the rear of the Flemish line. Along the entire front, the melee continued. Most of the French army was involved in the fighting. Right, they sent in most of the troops. In f so much that at one point the situation looked critical for the Flemings. Right, especially in the center, as we have seen, the men of the Franco of Bruges um, fought bravely, but still ran into serious difficulties. This is properly the, the culminating point of the attack. Nobody knows how it's going to end. Right, uh, John of Rennes hastens to help with the reserve. That's what uh, that had been pre-ordered to, of course. Which is what manages to drive back the French knights in the center. This is very important because it, it encourages the Flemish center to go over for the attack, to the attack, right? So, followed by both wings, right? Uh, so, um, to develop a general Flemish counterattack, which the rebels were at considerable advantage now. So what happens is that the uh, the the tides are turning because the the French cavalry has enough uh, force to spend in in the attack. But then, when the thing exhausts itself, they can't defend, and they're even in, on a bad on a bad ground for doing it. So after the initial shock in the fight, uh, superior numbers, uh, the this important success in the center for which the reserve manages to stem the French um, breakthrough uh, infuses the Flemish with uh, great uh, renewed uh, courage and the whole Flemish army starts pushing heavily, ferociously against the French. Right? This is really, uh, we don't know how it happened, in how much time and so on, but we are speaking essentially of possibly three or four thousand Flemings attacking 1600 heavy cavalry now, with weapons that uh, were at this point longer than, than those of the nobles. Um, at least, uh, I don't know where, if Verbruggen is right about this, because um, technically, yeah, I mean, the the knight wouldn't fight with, with the lance um, on on foot necessarily. Uh, it would be more difficult, let's say, um, but not much because it's difficult to fight with, because they they had some difficulty to fight with the lance, as we've seen. But simply because uh, the enemy is greater, so with the lance, what, what can you do? Right? It's better. It's much more effective to if you are surrounded. It's much better to. Uh, uh, shield yourself with uh, sword and shield um, and to be dramatically more dynamic. We can even imagine this, this French knights at some point overwhelmed by the enemy forces that had all these various pole arms and traumatic weapons and they would gradually um, attack them and you know, aggress them and, and knock them down. Uh, at this point uh, the, the situation is is dramatic because the French realize they have spent all their resources, they have committed their world troops, and they have not managed to break through. So they understood. They understood it was over. Right? Uh, many were forced to give ground, uh, were, or were driven back towards the two brooks. Robert of Artois, who had not taken part in general charge, realized immediately that his army would be defeated, especially if now as it now was being thrown back into either of the brooks. So he um, he thinks that the situation can be still saved, and he orders the rear guard to advance and personally goes into action with his knights. Right. So this is literally the, the last resort, and if the elite uh, and the command are uh, being sent, and this is li literally 
the last resources they can spend because there were, as we'll see, there, there was also rare guard. There were, um, I, I mean, other units, but uh, that was, I mean, someone had to remain. Also, they couldn't literally send till the last man in. Artois and his men um, charged the troops of Guy of Namur. At this point, uh, this this was a risky moment for the Flemish because uh, these were the East Flemish. Um, who had become naturally much less compact during the counter-attack phase. This is what the, the Flemish will actually pay early also in future battles. The fact that, yeah, they managed to hold the the, the cavalry, the enemy cavalry charge, and but eventually to, to exploit the victory they have to pass to the counter-attack, but by doing that they basically have to, one, abandon their order, to abandon their position, so they're just, you know, commoners like any in any other situation, and if cavalry, can't, cavalry catches them in the open, they're done for. And ex that's exactly what would happen at some point, even in situations in which they could reform and uh, and hold for a while. They would be the because that was the normality up to this point, and in a way it would remain normal, right? This infantry victories do not happen everywhere in Europe, and even in the same places where they happen, eventually they are reversed at some point because it's not that magically or or, or uh, deterministically or um, structurally this now, you know, infantry uh, is more important than cavalry. Hell no. Hell no. It will remain very important, more important up to the Renaissance warfare f fundamentally. Um, Artois drives deep into the East Flemish ranks and reaches the standard where he even manages to tear, to tear off part of the banner, right? Think about this. This, this is serious. I mean, if the guy get to that point, he, he has almost broken the enemy, right? And even he, he manages himself to tear off part of the, the enemy banner. So even think about the, the value of these individuals. I mean, yeah, great Flemish victory, but as you understand here, this this battle proves the excellence of feudal warfare as well these guys perform exactly what they are projected to do Artois uh, charge coupled with the approach of also of the French rearguard other troops started the panic in the Flemish ranks of Guy of Namur right some Infantry starts fleeing as well, right? So the situation is critical because also if they break there, um, they can't catch the, the wall, the wall Flemish army from the uh, from the yeah the rear because the Flemish uh, the, the 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 left is uh, inclined to in depth uh, behind. So that's also another moment in which actually the Flemish can still be uh, defeated. But uh, I'll bite the situation now for the French overall has been critical. There are situations in battles where, okay, a sec in a section, uh, a part wins and another loses, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the majority of the troops, as we've seen also, were engaged actually in the center, right, in the main line, on the Great Brook. So, those probably would have been decisive, but we do not know, objectively. Um, in the meantime, Artois was also attacked by other Flemish troops, he defended himself splendidly, right? But Willem van Zavting, a lay brother of Ter Deus, felt uh, the horse of the French commander-in-chief. So Artois is dragged off in, in the fall. He perishes covered with wounds, right? Because as we were saying before, you don't simply break through an armor. Uh, and these guys were literally beaten to death or pierced in the few open spots of the armor that are still also, you know, there is all uh, different layers of protection underneath. So it's actually a, 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 a torture, like an agony, uh, a terrible... And, and these guys also would keep on fighting because also you don't just kill a person like in movies that, you know, you stab them and that person immediately loses consciousness. And sometimes it happens. You know, with very heavy strikes or very deep strikes, you know, you can't 
you know, human bodies react differently in a way, but there are people who are wounded tens of times mortally before before stopping to fight, right? Especially guys who are covered in the best armor of the time that most mostly cannot be broken by enemy weapons. So it's uh, these are the moments like in which naturally also now the pursuit begins in a way. So it, it, this is literally the bloodiest moment of every battle in the ugliest and the most dramatic and the most hor horrifying, right? Um, where don't don't think this was just about killing. You know, many of these people were taken, would be tortured, would be cut to pieces. As far as we're concerned, it would even be eaten alive, right? This happens. There is evidence. I don't know if the Battle of Kursre, but you know, many many well Europe often that such things actually happened. Anthropophagy was not not uncommon. This is nothing to do with being a savage. This is with being human and, and, and hateful and and extremely violent and lacking, you know, any respect or having full contempt of certain people. We know it happens. It also in in civil, uh, very civilized contexts. Uh, you can imagine now even the retreat on the banks of the brooks. The knights and squires would defend themselves with desperate courage, Beca especially if they were being uh, pressed by the enemy, so that. You, you can't say, okay, now I will cross the, the brook, aside from the fact that many could even, you know, draw into them, especially with foot armor, but at least some, I, I presume most men would be capable of, of crossing. I mean, one thing is a river, one thing is a brook, but um, the point is, you, you're attacked from all sides. So even the time you, you try to cross this thing, you, I don't know, you're you're smashed, but, 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 you know, with, with, a, with a candle uh, stick in, in the head, or Whatever. I mean, it's really risky, right? Uh, many also pro presumably sacrifice themselves to allow others to, to, to escape. And the same Flemish were crossing the brooks, as we will see. So, many French knights were horribly slaughtered. They, uh, some would fall in the water, uh, others being willing, willingly uh, drowned. Not even horses were spared. Because they probably wanted even to avoid um, the French to to get away. Um, presumably, others would you know look at this very fine mount and say, you know, I can make a freaking lot of money by either selling this. So not all horses were were killed. But the idea is that at the moment, as we've seen, don't even pursue, right? Because it was difficult. This guy, this Flemish, are de completely devoid of discipline, right? They don't know what it is. They're not trained. They're not professional troopers. So what? What will be a problem also in future battles, are, are, as we have seen, is that they will abandon the formation even without being told to, simply pursuing the enemy because they see it broken. Then the enemy maybe reforms and invests them and kills them. So that's why the orders were at the beginning of the battle were pretty, you know, harshly as we have seen oriented towards do not move, do not try to start looting because the enemy may have uh, concealed uh, reserves around. We may be destroyed even if we win the battle. Um, but presumably, um, I mean, this battle is so huge, like, the only fact that this outcome had now showed, uh, revealed its face, uh, was probably so morally astonishing that, first of all, these guys could not be contained, because now, literally, the Flemish were completely exalted, the, the French were completely devastated, psychophysically speaking, I mean, uh, Probably even the realization of what happened was incredible, right? Uh, uh, as we will see, part of the reserves basically fly. I mean, they, they could have even attacked the, the, the flanks, but they, they did not do it. The French losses were appalling. Think that only one leader of all the French cavalry units who had taken part in the engagement was captured. The rest, all the rest were killed. So it means that all of these men made their war job, right? They they did what they were made for, to fight or die. Some presumably were simply fleeing, were killed. But the fact that specifically the leaders in this count are, you know, uh, the, the first ones, the, the ones who would last uh, the longest, because they were the more burdened, politically and social, 
Generally speaking, do not ever think, even for an instant, that elites historically uh, in the Middle Ages were kind of parasitic. Uh, you know, thugs was just stayed there, did nothing. These people were the heart of the world society and politics, from the peasants to themselves. Um, the whole world gravitated around them, so they couldn't screw up. And if they did, they had to die with honor to redeem themselves, they're named one of their, their lineage and all this stuff. Uh, these people spent themselves and were pressured more than any other si person in the entire society. There is no comparison between, uh, you know, the, the responsibility, of course, and the, the, the crushing responsibility that a, that a high noble had compared to the peasant. The, the peasant could simply live a disgusting life, oppressed, uh, vexed, bullied, you know, you know, uh, horribly. But the 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 sheer weight of of the whole society of your over your your shoulders. Well, that's what a peasant didn't have and couldn't care less of, and that's also why it was, you know, considered as nothing, because objectively it didn't contribute in that sense. Um, so we we cannot understand as people of the twenty uh, the twenty the twenty first century. What, what, what it can mean, the sense of honor and pride of a medieval noble. Also, the the the, the unspeakable sense of uh, of oneself, and of course, these were bastards. By this, you know, I'm not trying to exalt them. These were horrible people, like most of the people actually were at the time, and that we still are largely, right? Um, this was a disgusting world, as the world has always been. Um, and this, by our, our own, not much moral, but in terms of just sheer justice, justice standards, um, in terms of sheer economical reason, was, was, was horrifying, right? So um, it, it's not just for saying it. It's just, of course, that civilization grows. So we cannot blame this world for having existed, because without it, we, we wouldn't have what we have now. Um, and this is also what we often forget that you need this stuff for arriving to what we have now. Because uh, civilization does not happen because uh, there are these uh, pure innocent forces of humanity trapped by the evil bully and the evil person. No. Um, it's, it's humans understanding they cannot go on simply killing each other as, as they have always been doing in the entire history of mankind. Right? Um, the, all the cultures in the world have nothing and done nothing historically but exterminating, enslaving, raping each other. And we're talking about each other. I mean, the same people next door, right? So every moral assessment uh, from our side today uh, should be motivated. That is, you can't do it, but why would you do it, right? What do you think, that you are better for, for this reason or that because you feel morally superior? You're, you're likely, you know, the individual capacities that these people have are much higher than yours. Never fall into the uh, the, the childish uh, mistake of believing that you are more intelligent than a person that lives in, in the Middle Ages, because you are not. Right? You are not. And there is actually a very few we can be proud of, to, given our personal accomplishments today, uh, given what these people were normally brought to live in. Right? Uh, we often spoke of the training of a medieval knight. These people were were uh, brutalized, uh, abused, uh, openly tortured at, at times. If you look at the initi initiatic rituals back in the tribal, uh, to, to become what they were, because they couldn't otherwise perform these tasks if they hadn't been like that. And this happened regularly, like it was the specific ether through which you, otherwise you couldn't become anything like this. How can you create such a tough mind to spend your life butchering people? Have you ever wondered that? I mean, it's something apparently insane for our own standards. Well, these people did it regularly. So just think about the, the, the difference, the sheer difference of the world we're talking about. Uh, so the rest, we know that the French were literally butchered. Like the the, the prisoners were were slaughtered. I mean, this was like a, a bloodbath, to say the least. And as soon as 
they uh, had defeated the enemy on the banks of the brooks, the Flemish, as we've seen, also crossed over themselves to attack the remainder, the, the, the French rearguard. These were two cavalry units that, um, at the beginning, actually acted as if they were to make an attack in turn, but they actually made no move. Uh, the deterrent here is very important because the Flemish, yes, now were were believing to be absolutely superior to the French, mentally speaking. Uh, Villani, for example, states that now that the, the Flemish had been so exalted that just one um, one of them equipped with a golden duck would have been willing to attack two French knights. Perhaps is a bit exaggerated. Um, and they surely knew at this point that abandoning the Brooks now, if there were other cavalry units out there, it was very risky to meet them in the open because they were fresh, they were still compact. But what they were actually doing there, mounted, was just giving time for the baggage to retreat. And in fact, no sooner did the Flemings advance, actually the heavy cavalry fled in panic. And this tells you, and we have observed this in the von Clausewitz series, I mean, what it literally means that the moral forces simply evaporate, right? Uh, this is not a matter of what you can mechanically do. That's what we were saying before. This is not about technology. This is not about weapons. This is about the fact that the no ones of the world have destroyed the all of the world. This is a world upside down, right? This is also what we cannot properly understand, because I presume, at least even myself, that for now, I've been, you know studying my share of stuff about medieval history uh, uh, you know you, we pictured the, they try to picture the thing of course in, in a, as, as objectively as we can right so we try to picture in a detached sense but I, I presume we can we will never of course understand what it meant to be there but what helps probably here is realizing that there is an entire vision of the world that starts from from all the aspects it's not just about what you a perspective. It's literally the world is founded on on feudalism. The the world is meant to be with those guys at the top and the others working for them. Nobody has, you know, you can't even think there can be another reality. But if you have lived exclusively in this one, that is, how can you can you think that? We know that there are these problems today, right? Uh, my tutor once she she received, for example. Um, I think it was two years ago, a Chinese student. And, and this student didn't know what religion was from communist China. And, and my tutor, I don't know, how, how do you explain to a person that has been brought up without knowing that religion even exists, what religion is? Right? And we, we see, you see it, just speak about to people that lived in the Soviet Union, they, they were extraneated from the world. This was something objectively had never been seen. So it's even beyond, because it, it's not about living in a, in a, in a so, in political social system rather than another. The, the entire universe is conceived within those, that mentality. Right. There is a debate on, of course, whether you know what the peasantry did really think. It's mostly the, the idea of universalism and of scholastic that we can document and project in this regard. Probably these were, uh, can say, more secular realities because, of course, these were wholly you know religious. They, 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 but secular in the sense that they, they were less, um, especially in this decentralized areas of uh, you know the, the the boundaries of the the, the feudal rule. They, they were. A, perhaps a bit more dynamic, but nobody, not even themselves, would expect to make it. Or if they did, they had enormous doubts that this victory, when actually happened, was 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 astonishing. Was unbelievable. Right? Um, the French infantry also um, they the, the French cavalry fled towards Lille, Tournai. Uh, the infantry also took their heels. The Flemish chased them as far as uh, Belgium, uh, Saint Denis, and Dotenis, um, that is 11 kilometers from the battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
and by evening the fleeing Frenchmen reached Tournay exhausted where they bartered their equipment for bread though some of them were still too shocked to eat right we have this this information ah by the way I didn't say that um, Verbruggen wrote actually a book on the battle of um, the battle of the golden spores uh, before I I was telling you I'm actually quoting it from from here but he made the famous the, the slug the golden spawn that, that he's eventually translated I even have it and I have even read it but I didn't tell you because I, f I simply forgot um, but um, the um, so if you really want a thorough analysis by the book it's like 200 pages beautifully written um, and Verbruggen was really one of the best um, military historians out there. This one specifically, the art of warfare in Western Europe during the Middle Ages from the 8th century to 1340 is very beautiful because it's literally about Europe, right? It's Western European warfare as a whole. So it takes into consideration all things that truly matter. They, it speaks a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, let's call it Batavian school, of course, is a bit... Um, you know, he they they like to celebrate the Flemish, of course, and they they're good because Verbruggen doesn't exaggerate, but maybe a bit more of room for other realities is is necessary, especially in the, today's time. Consider that these were works, I think, the Battle of the Golden Spores is like from the 1950s, something like that. So now it's updated, but it, it's still one of those moments in which nobody had come to the fully scientific study of these battles. If, not in, unbiased, in a biased way. So, uh, Verbruggen is specifically the base for this. Um, like, it's a very good starting point. At least I began with this text here. There are, there are also others, but I followed this Batavian school, him and De Vries at the beginning. Batavian by joke as a name. Eh? Uh, and yet, uh, the the further step then is to study the sources because as I always repeated you 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 cannot clearly understand or you know say come as close to understand a battle historically if you don't study the sources you can't read a study and pretend that you actually know the battle it doesn't work like that because the study is filtered in a way there is no uh, mental application you're just reading something that someone else has already worked and if until you don't make it work yourself you will never understand what is written even if you understand it linguistically or you learn it by heart right studying military history is a completely different thing from reading from studying other historical stuff it's simply a world on its own it works on its own right and this thing that um, the French uh, that arrived to Tournay were still in shock, so that they couldn't eat, especially after the exhausting and you know energy draining uh, all the thing, the battle, the, the the escape. You know these guys would have uh, eaten otherwise a, a horse entire, maybe their own. Um, no, they they sold them for bread, uh, but they uh, that tells you what it is that happens in these things. You are, you're not worried, you're not upset, you're shocked. I mean, in the clinical condition of it, the term shock is, well, maybe even here it's too hard, but it's a specific medical thing. It's not how, you know, journalistically we have, uh, uh, let's say, freed the, 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 the use of the term. That there are specific, we presume in this battle, certain people died of shock. I'm not kidding, but also of heat, of exhaustion. Uh, we know it, it happened. I have read many battle accounts in which it's explicitly said that uh, at some point, you know, that they they collapsed because an organism, if it's too stressed, it you know, it goes it goes off, right? And that's exactly what what happened in certain circumstances. Um, people dying of tiredness. So between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon. The Flemish have achieved a huge victory, right? For all its meaning, its intensity, um, its even its material reality, which, in fact, uh, is exemplified by the loss of life of more than a thousand French noblemen. Right? This was a French cannon, we could say. Um, 
it's astonishing. In fact, there are many, uh, many battle accounts that also parallel eventually and think that uh, in certain chronicles the list of French dead is longer than the battle account. Which is not so strange, right? I, I was studying a similar page just yesterday. Um, and this makes you understand mostly the importance that this nobleman had, right? Because you would think, how do I write a battle uh, account today? Like, I made a video like this and I tried to sum up the tactical engagement. Well, a, a 14th century chronicler would have would have not reasoned like this, unfortunately for us, but still giving us some information that is that makes us understand what is really important. If you if you you know certain tactical details are skipped, but the name of certain obscure noblemen that we would we wouldn't even know, prosopographically speaking, biographically, in um, is it s tells you how central the fact that this nobleman had been killed was. Right, and they're important in society altogether, of course. But how big this thing had been. It's estimated that half of the attacking knights died. Which, in terms of medieval warfare, uh, contrarily to what is commonly said, even among the same knights, you know, medieval warfare was pretty damn bloody. Right, it, it's not true that it was like more you know, um, well, let's say softer, just because the guys had, you know, where maybe the elite was more armored, and oh, it's a, this, uh, it's like a pers perspectical distortion. It, it's not true. Th these battles were extremely violent, but still, you know, 50% losses is, is appalling, to say the least. Right? It didn't come, usually not even close to that. We can't say... Already one uh, out of four is huge, but one out of two, and of elite troops, killed, not even imprisoned, like was normally the case, killed, slaughtered like animals. That, that that's that's bad, and this is the elite of the world. The Flemish amassed enormously valuable booty, and at least five hundred golden spores. And many banners were picked up on the battlefield and they uh, were preserved in the church of the Virgin in Courtrai. Whence the French removed them eight years later, by the way, after the battle of Vestrotsbeck. The Flemish apparently uh, lost only a few hundred men dead. Alright, so you have heard the story. Uh, as you have gotten habituated, I presume at this point, this is where we stopped the video about uh, with the end of the tactical engagement. Uh, what can I tell? Uh, well, more to maybe just give you some other thing, to, you know, an opinion from me, but, but you don't have to care specifically. But I, I, I care about leaving the right um, idea of this battle. I think. Actually, I will not repeat myself because we have already commented the wall point. But consider especially one point. That is to say that... Wh what did you notice of this? Right? It's not so immediate. You may have other perspectives, other interests. But what struck me when I, in the past, began to, to thoroughly look at this battle is that... Uh, I mean, it's not just, I mean, the fact of the knights and the commoners. I mean, from a from a political and social point of view, that is, of course, the most important thing of, of the battle. And that's why we will make a video about this specifically and the consequences of Courtrai. Because also, contrarily to what is usually believed, uh, in the Middle Ages, news traveled dramatically fast all over, right? Uh, it's just that the majority of people couldn't care less. Like, if you're a peasant from even 200, you know, kilometers away and you're still under safe French rule, what the hell do you care? I mean, yeah, I mean, some, something can change, but um, it's not that that's what, what you're all concentrated on. Um, but as far as the nobility was concerned, or at least the people who ruled was, were concerned, because there were also the cities and others, news traveled pretty damn fast. Uh, we know everybody receiving this 
news in, of course, in France, in England, in Germany, in Italy, where Boniface VIII, that was, by the way, in contrast with Frederick, uh, Philip IV, the king of France, at this time, it also risked to be killed a few years, uh, you know, a few time later, in the same way against the Flemish, by the way, um, rejoiced because, you know, the problems between Boniface and Philip. Uh, it um, just kind of ironic because they were technically still allies in the broader Guelph uh, Angevin Papal alliance that at that point still dominated m most of Western Europe. Uh, but what struck me specifically um, is from from a tactical point of view because my work at this point is mainly tactical. What strikes you here, and perhaps today we haven't looked at it with due attention because we haven't analyzed the various battle accounts, that's why I would like also even to make more than one video about it, is the fact that the Flemish army and the Flemish armed systems, we could call it, was extremely simple. Right? There was nothing sophisticated about this. There is nothing special, even about the Gödendag or whatever the, you know they called it like, because the French called it like that, as we've seen. Um, the Gepin der Stave, that is actually how they called it, the, Fle the Flemish called it. Ditches were also built pretty much everywhere. Uh, you know, infantrymen were common infantrymen. Pikemen already existed. Um, you know, uh, crossbows. Now, what is here that really distinguishes the Flemish? basically nothing. And why would it? These were all Europeans. They fought in, the, in, in Western Europe, they fought all in the same identical way. Right? So any, once again, technologistic um, approach to this has zero value. Um, tactically speaking, you'd say, well, there was an innovation of some sort because of these weapons and this arrangement in the units, the various layers. Well, yes, but do we... Mm, I, I presume we don't actually have much evidence aside from these battles of how the thing otherwise differed, and chances are that it didn't differ at all, right? Um, here, maybe I stress too much the fact that these were um, people who had, which, which is true objectively, that there were no no warriors, they there were no, uh, they were simple commoners. They didn't have much practice with arms. Of course, they they knew about violence. They had their own arms in this regard, but. It's, I would like to, to stress that, 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 that European warfare at, at many levels, and not just the, the, the French one, it, it was dramatically more advanced than this. This is an extremely simple, I don't want to say primitive, because maybe it's excessive, but you know it's literally nothing special. What is that makes a difference? The moral force. It's the fact that these guys got so fed up with the French domination, their attempt, attempt to be subjugated, they, they, they decide to stand to ri risking their lives, and they do it skillfully, right? They will think of the ditches, the equipment, the belonging, the, 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 the nightly uh, advisors and, and, and commanders and so on. It, it's all part of the of the formula, of the recipe, right? But if you really look at, at how this thing differs from anything else, uh, it doesn't much, and especially, it, it's really nothing special. And as the rest of 14th and 15th century Flemish military history actually proves, these guys weren't able to accomplish much else after this. So that, I, I believe me, I didn't want to insist for specific reasons. Like, if I had studied Flemish military history and I had found a specific battle that they won eventually, well, Monon Pavel is the, the greatest other success, but eventually not so much. All the rest of the, of the battles, up to Guinegat, is a series, we're talking about 200, almost 200 years, it's exclusively not just defeats, it's military disasters. So the, the question here is, let's try to look at things in perspective. Let's try to realize that the, why do I say this specifically? Because I want to get rid of the cliche that magically now the infantry rose to prominence. This is objectively not true. The first half of the 14th century is remarkable in terms of infantry victories, and there is surely a systematic and structural uh, reason for this. It happens in specific areas of Europe that are Flanders, mostly Scotland, uh, 
Switzerland part, the German Dietmarscher, uh, Martian uh, area with the Dietmarscher that also accomplished their own share of um, of, of uh, accomplishment, but limited. Uh, also, there is all the English thing that is an exception because it's really a royal thing. It's not a popular thing. It doesn't stem from the lower classes. It's a scientific military reform from the side of the English monarchy. And it's one of the single greatest successes uh, struck. I mean, actually, as I often told you, if you look just on the numbers, the, the, the uh, English armies of the Hundred Years' War are the most effective armies in history as far as, um, uh, let's say, symmetry conditions are concerned. Symmetry in this sense means that objectively there is no e difference materially, technologically, between England or France, right? And so you, if you have this astonishing series of victories in dramatic uh, numerical inferiority against French cavalry and so on, you, the, there is no other army in history that accomplished that on a repeated basis, like the English army did, right? It's not that now the English army was, you know, the, uh, you know, we have to say, ah, oh, the greatest army in history, and it, it, it's contextual, right? It's always contextual, but it's probably it. But in the mid-14th century, these infantries, at a certain point, declined. I mean, yes, maybe they remained, the world has changed, these battles have shocked the reality of, of the time, there is an, an enormous change, and Courtre is specifically the most, single most important one, for sure, for sure, because the, you know, what the Dithmarscher did against the Count of Holstein can can be, yeah, important, but up to a certain point. I mean, the, the worst sound of the least, you know, uh, the developed place. But you know, we were talking about Flanders, you talk about France. Here we're talking about the the heart of military development in practice, and also in theory, um, and you have this thing, this was overwhelming, this is the path opener, and simply also from a tactical point of view, the greatest infantry victory, but then it stops, and this thing doesn't live on, there is not a specific legacy, right, the ones that will change the game, for reasons that were completely in, in, uh, individual to, uh, to, to them, uh, were the Swiss, the Swiss after the Battle of Arpedo, after having been defeated in the 20s of the 15th century by the dismounted knights of the Carmagnola that basically had l longer lances than the, the halberds and def it bloodly defeat the Swiss that up to that point had made of the halberd their national thing. They had It's one day when they had ambushed the Habsburgs and chopped them down, all this thing. They decide, okay, let's arm everybody with pikes because we've seen that pikes is what we need on the field. And from there... And also for that specific reason, not because you know Switzerland was a, a country like another. Switzerland was a, a, a unique country in that regard. Was a confederacy. Was a country of, of multiple of, of lots of people, right? All together controlled by a, f a, a confederal government. So they had a unitary development of this military reform. They introduced the finger of, of the Pike Squares that eventually gets copied by all the rest of Europe, and um, Renaissance warfare breaks. Uh, in, by the way, w wiping out the Swiss because as soon as you know uh, the arquebuses are properly combined, equally with the pikes, you know they're they're out of the game as well. That's the Spanish that in fact create properly modern warfare with uh, Gonzalo de Cordoba, el gran capitán, and um, and that's all another story. Like Swiss pikemen have pr practically nothing to do because they're with. I don't know, the, the guys of uh, Morgart. Because they are ad advancing uh, offensive pikemen that can defeat cavalry in open ground. The first guys were ambushers, fundamentally. Right, en masse, offensively, but, I don't know, attacking a column, you know, it's normally, well, if you it hasn't deployed battlefield, it's not a, a great accomplishment. I mean, it, it's a great skillful think to, to achieve strategically in that sense, but tactically speaking, that, yeah, you, you can attack them. It's like how, I don't know, think about the oblique order. Uh, that's the same concept in a way. Uh, it's this, this condition of asymmetry that puts the enemy at a disadvantage that is what you're searching for, and that is good enough, as it's been good enough to be simply armed in, and deployed in at Courtre, coupled with great moral force to win the flower, the flower of French cavalry. 
that's it. But once again, how does this um, eventually change the game? It turns out, if you continue to read the story, that it really didn't. Right? Uh, specifically, Flanders didn't... Um, you know, didn't produce much of that. While the Swiss, for example, that were also a bit the the ones that mostly accomplished this, this, this uh, ambushes, or they had very high favor of ground, um, or other things like that, that seemed, therefore, not to be exactly the, 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 the most brilliant, you know, unlike the Flemish, uh, increase over time their capability and make especially this very, very marked jump in the mid-15th century for reasons that were different from the ones of 14th century European context. That had nothing to do with that, practically. So, let's learn how to uh, specifically separate the various stages, right? And I'm not even saying, uh, you know, I don't want to convince you to think otherwise, but I tell you, look at that, because it's objectively very... Like, if you look at military at least the outcomes of battles, you, you you can realize the disproportion pretty easily. At least. Then how generalized this is? Well, this is something you can learn. Or better, how... Mm, yeah, I mean, how systematic this is, is what you can learn just only through comparative analysis that takes literally years and years, because all of these battles can be studied properly only in months each, and, um, and compared even in more years. So that needs a very specific specific uh, researcher that does it and I can't hide you that I would like to be on but I don't think I don't think so because I think I will remain focused mostly on a certain regional reality but still comparing a lot with uh, with the broader European one um, and and that's how we should tell the story right making the history before because otherwise it's flat right it's not very interesting let's be honest um, so I, I hope to have given a, a balanced, um, you know, judgment of the thing. Uh, I think I have clarified enough the greatness of this victory, the, its uh, incredible importance, its uh, astonishing value in the history of, 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 of uh, medieval warfare, but of military history broadly meant. Let's just exactly understand what it was. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that we can't really appreciate what it concretely was, because otherwise uh, you're faking it, and you're not even rendering a good service to the to the winners of this battle, also to the losers of this battle, as we have seen, because they would have not told it to you in the same way you would like to tell it, right? And it's a great challenge for a historian to to even speak up about it, because it's like trying to you know, to substitute yourself to the voices that cannot be, uh, can do not exist anymore. So, it, it, there is always, at least I, I feel it, this dark moral, uh, you know, pressure to, to say, well, you're kind of not saying it right, and who can't really, but we try, we try. Um, so, for now, uh, we just stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.